Go. Oh, all right. So let's begin. Uh, so, so up until now, we've been looking at. Uh, I mean, yesterday's class, we were looking at. Uh, oh my God. We are we now not looking at it. So let's look at this. Serious problem. It's not coming back again. Okay. So this is fine, no? You can see everything. All right. So, so we've been we've been looking at uh, polynomials over finite fields, and I was trying to point out that the that there is some connection between there is a very important connection between irreducible polynomials and fields. Yeah, so there's a danger of keeping it on this side. So it seems very loose and I'm not able to tighten it. Is there anything that okay. So I guess maybe I'm doing it the wrong direction. Alright, so I'll learn to look at that. So we've been looking so far at polynomials over finite fee specifically. I think I gave you some examples over F two X and then F three X and we saw that for our there are quite a different variety of polynomials. Some of them are reducible. There are many, many which are irreducible, really right? So I think, and uh, and I was commenting how in the in the in the infinite fields like the rational field and the real field and complex field, you take irreducible polynomials and get bigger fields from it. Okay? So similar thing is true here, and we'll we'll now first see some constructions of other finite fields, some simple examples, very quick, just to give you a feel for how it works, and then we'll do it a bit more formally. Okay, so the first thing we are going to see is what is called F4. Okay, so F4, it is also denoted GF4, I will come back to that later. F4 is a finite field with four elements. Okay, so I will show you the construction now. It is a very simple construction. You will see how, how easy it is to think about this construction and you can. We can we can add to it later. Okay, so so the crucial idea is polynomials uh, over F two. Okay, so F four can be thought of as constructed using polynomials over F two. Okay, so so this is the construction. I'll I'll provide the construction first, and then we'll go back and interpret it carefully. Okay, so F four can be constructed as follows. Okay, so any field will have the additive identity, which we'll call zero. And then outside of the additive identity, you will have the multiplicative group, and that will have a multiplicative identity, which we we'll call one. Okay. And then F four should have just two other elements. Okay. So let's see what we can do with zero and one. Can you do anything with zero and one to create new elements? The only thing you can possibly do is one plus one. Okay. But I'm going to say one plus one is zero. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to put that constraint here in F four. It turns out. If you don't have one plus one is zero, you can never have an F four. Okay, so we'll come, we'll come back to that later on. But anyways, for F four, we'll have one plus one being zero. Okay, so basically, addition will be modulo two. Okay, so it will continue to be modulo two addition like we had before. Okay, so plus zero one, and then we need two other elements. So the way to think about them, so one one way to construct them is to say I'll have the two elements as alpha and one plus alpha. Okay, so this is one. Uh, this is one description. We we'll come back and generalize this, but I'll tell you how to make this into a field. Okay, so first of all, this is alpha and one plus alpha. We don't know what they are, but, but let's say this is the this is the field. Okay, but I have to now define multiplication. Okay, but as far as addition is concerned, check real quick that addition is okay. Okay, you can check here now real quick that addition is okay. If I add one one with alpha, what will happen? I get one plus alpha. That's there. If I add alpha with itself, what will happen? Alpha plus alpha is going to be Zero because I'm going to say that is two alpha and then addition is modulo two, so it's zero. Okay, so you have to treat alpha like an indeterminate unknown variable. Okay, treat it like an indeterminate. Okay, like x or something. Okay, or if you if you really don't like x, you can treat it like your famous i. Okay, i is the square root of minus one. Okay? So you know how comfortably you are using i every time we deal with complex numbers. Think of this alpha like the i. But instead of the complex numbers and real numbers, we have this over just F2. Okay, so F4 and F2 in, uh, alpha is some indeterminate variable which we are using to define F4. Okay, so the best way to think about it is like it's i. Okay, so i is like square root of minus one. We have alpha. Okay, now only thing that's undefined now is multiplication. Okay, 
So for multiplication, we need some rule. So for that, it turns out the following rule is good enough. You would say alpha square equals alpha plus 1. Okay, so I can do that. So, so if you remember in the complex multiplication, oh my god, did I make some mistake with that previous button or what is health analysis? Excuse me, crazy, I'm telling you. Anyway, so alpha square is alpha plus 1. So, for instance, in the complex numbers, thank you. Okay, so for the complex numbers, you also have a similar rule for multiplication. What is that rule? I square is minus 1. Thing. So, so likewise, I'm going to say alpha square is alpha plus 1. Okay. So, now I have to check that this is a proper field. Okay. So, even for the complex numbers, you would have checked this. I'm not sure if you remember. You would have checked that A plus B I had a multiplicative inverse. Right? 1 by A plus B I. How do you do 1 by A plus B I? A minus B I by A square plus B square. So, you know that that is the inverse of 1, one by A, A plus B I. So, if you do A plus B I times A minus B I by A square plus B square, you get 1. Okay, as long as a and b are either of them is not 0, you know you can always find the 1 by a plus b. Similar thing we have to check here. Okay, except that it is only finite, it is much easier to check. Okay, so 1 it is trivial, multiplicative inverse of 1 is 1 itself. What about for alpha? Okay, it has to be one of the two other elements, right? And I have already told you that it is a phi, so it might exist. So, what has to be the multiplicative inverse of alpha? It has to be 1 plus alpha, right? So, it has to work out that way. So, you do alpha times 1 plus alpha, what will you get? You get alpha plus alpha squared, but then alpha squared is alpha plus 1, so it cancels and you will get 1. Okay. So, so everything is satisfied and this becomes a field. Okay. So, the first thing to get used to in finite fields is there will be an indeterminate alpha. Okay. In every finite field you will have that. This is similar to the indefinite indeterminate i that you have in the complexes. Okay. And it turns out there are these whole bunch of wonderful objects called algebraic number fields which you would have never learnt I think in the engineering mathematics that you saw where you can extend the comp the rational numbers in a similar way you can add an indeter indeterminate alpha or beta and extend the rational numbers ok so unfortunately in your math you would have never seen it it is a nice a nice thing if you have seen it then this finite field will be easier for you but if you have not seen it if the only thing you have seen is complex numbers then the i is good enough ok i square is minus 1 like that in every finite field we will see we will have an alpha which is an indeterminate and it will have satisfy some rule ok that rule will be useful for multiplication for addition you won't need anything it will be very simple ok so this will be a general form of the construction ok so I will show you one more example and then we will plunge into the general theory where we will see how to think of these things in general ok in general there is a very different way to think about it and there is also a very strong nice structure in it but but for now we will just look at uh, we will look at one more example ok so I should erase this. You know, this monitor is not smart enough to distinguish between the pen and my finger. Maybe somebody should design a better monitor. Alright, so let's uh, so let's uh, let's move on to another example. The example I want to give is F9, which is a slightly more complicated example. Okay, so here, okay, so it turns out in F9 also you will have zero and one. Is there a question? Is there a question? What is the question? Is there a problem? How do you justify? I will come to it slowly, slowly enough. Okay. So, the way to think about it, we will think about it easy in some other way, but that is that's, that's, that's my choice. I mean, this is a valid field now. I have an F4, right? So that, that there is no problem. With, okay. So, right now, I am not justifying all my choices. I will do it later, but this is just for you to get used to how these things will look. Okay. Suddenly, if you, if you do not have a field for these things, I will use this in a lot of examples also. So, it is just good to have a couple of examples for this. Okay. So, F9 is once again a field with 9 elements. Uh, so, I am going to have a 0 and a 1. Okay. So, here I will have 1 and then I will have 1 plus 1. I will not force 1 plus 1 to be 0. I will call 1 plus 1 as 2. Okay. Just using our familiar number system. So, 1 plus 1 I will call as 2. But 1 plus 1 plus 1 I will force to 0. Okay. So, it turns out for F9 you have to have something like this, otherwise it, it will not work. Okay. If you want a field with 9 elements, you have to have 0, 1 and you should have 0, 1 plus 1 doing something and you should have 1 plus 1 plus 1 as 0. Okay. So, these are obviously not trivial facts, it is slightly non-trivial, we will prove it later on, but for now just accept it. Okay. So, we will have 0, 1 and 2 and then we will have nothing else, it is 0. Okay. So, now we need 
six other elements to complete this fn f9 and once again i'll use some indeterminate alpha okay and now i'll make uh, elements with this so we'll have uh, so let's say uh, we'll have alpha we'll have two alpha so alpha plus one so alpha plus two we we'll have uh, two alpha plus one two alpha plus one Okay, so what I've done here is basically, so so if you think about it, there are nine elements here. They are all polynomials of degree less than or equal to one in alpha. Okay, do you agree on that? Okay, those are the nine elements that I've done here. Even if you go back here, these are also polynomials of degree one in alpha with coefficients zero and one. Okay, binary coefficients. Okay. All polynomials of degree less than equal. Same thing I'm doing here also. Okay, I'm going to take all polynomials in alpha, which is some indeterminate, of degree less than or equal to one. But then the coefficients are coefficients are ternary. Okay, so I have zero, one, and two. Okay, I'm allowing three coefficients. So that gives me nine polynomials. Now I need so addition is taken care of, right? I told you three is equal to zero. Okay, so addition is taken care of. If I add any two, I'll get another element from this field. There's no problem, and every element will have also a Additive inverse. Okay, both of them are guaranteed. Addition is very easy. Okay, for multiplication, I need a rule. Okay, so for that, I'll use I'll use this rule. Okay, so I'll say alpha squared. So I can use several rules. One rule I can use is say maybe alpha squared plus one is zero. Okay, so if you remember, uh, alpha squared plus one and in ternary in F3 it was irreducible, right? So x squared plus one was irreducible. So I'll always have to pick an irreducible guy. Anyway, alpha squared plus one equal to zero is a fine enough rule. Or you can choose some other rule if you like. Okay, we'll come to that later. Okay, so this is one rule you can use, and you can now check that this will be a field. Okay, so every element will have an inverse. It's a bit painful to go through and check. So let me see who can give me the inverse of alpha. Alpha. Two alpha. Two alpha is fine, right? Two alpha is the inverse of alpha, right? Alpha times two alpha is what? Two alpha squared. Alpha squared is two. Two times two is four. Four mod three becomes one again. Okay, so inverse of alpha is two alpha. Okay, so it looks like there is some scary computation involved with this alpha squared plus one equal to zero, and it's not very easy. Okay, so because it's it's You have to do some polynomial multiplication. You have to reduce it using this alpha squared plus one equal to zero. You can you can always do it. It's not it's not very hard. It's always possible. Like I said, this is a field, so every element, non-zero element, will have a valid inverse. Okay. So, but all these things are not very obvious. Okay. So I can keep giving you constructions like this, but there is a general way in which to think of these things, which is what we're going to see next. Okay. So that, that's very easy. The general way is also not too hard, but if you don't have these examples in mind. Will be a bit confused. So we're going to use these two examples later on. Every time I introduce something, I'll use examples from these two fields, f4 and f9, just to keep things very simple. Okay, maybe we'll see f8 also later. Okay, all right. So now let's go to construction of finite fields. Okay. So before we formally begin construction, so let's let's think of how we might want to think of a finite field. If somebody tells you, I have a finite field of. Okay. Okay, somebody says I have a field with a finite number of elements. Okay, so slowly let's see if we can extract some more information about this field. So we'll ask this person some questions, and then slowly try to figure out what is there inside this field. Okay, so the first thing you know that has to be there in any field is the additive identity. Okay, so we can agree with this person that the additive identity will call us zero. Okay, so yes, to agree, and we'll also agree. So it will be zero. Okay, now outside of this zero, we have a multiplicative group, and that multiplicative group there has to be a Identity, okay, and that has to be one. Okay, so that is two things we can agree on. There's no problem with that. Okay, and now with just these two, what else can I do? I can try to construct more fields. Now I can ask this person who has this finite field to tell me what one plus one is. Okay, because you know you agreed just it was a multiplicative identity one. Now I know I can take this and add it to itself. You tell me what one plus one is. He might tell you two. Then you say what is one plus one plus one is. 
you might tell you three, so on and so forth. Now, you can do adding one to itself how many times? As many times as you want, but you know that the field is finite. Okay, so eventually what has to happen? 1 plus 1 plus 1 several times has to go to 0. Okay, you might say has to repeat, but then if it repeats, you can also say, you can move everything to one side and say eventually the first repetition has to happen at 0. Okay, it cannot happen anywhere else. Okay. Right, think about it. So when you do 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, <coughs> you keep getting 1, 2, 3, 4, on, all that. Eventually it has to repeat back at 0 only. It cannot repeat somewhere in the middle. If you are repeating, then what do you have? 1 plus 1 plus 1, some x times, equals 1 plus 1 plus 1, some y times. You move all the y to this side, as in you might add with the additive inverse of 1. Okay, so you get 1 plus 1 plus 1, x minus y times being 0. So you must have encountered 0 before itself. Okay. So it will repeat definitely at 0 only. Okay. So there is a number of times, a minimum number of times you have to add 1 with itself to get 0. Okay. So you can ask that information from this person who has this final thing. Okay. How many times should I add 1 to itself to give me 0? I know 0 has to happen because it is a finite field. It cannot keep on going on and on forever. It has to stop somewhere. The repetition has to happen. So let us say where it happens. You tell me that number. Okay. That number has a special name for finite fields. It is called characteristic. Okay. So let us find the characteristic of the field. So what is the idea of the characteristic? 1, 1 plus 1, 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, etc. Okay. has to repeat somewhere, right? has to repeat. Okay. So this implies there exists minimum p okay, such that 1 plus 1 plus 1 so on t times equals 0 in f. Okay. So this needs a bit of play, but I kind of verbally proved it for you. I think you can think about it. It's, it's not too hard to imagine this. Okay. So when you add one plus one plus one to itself several times, there should be a number p, which for which when you add it three times, you should get the zero on the finite field. So now we can ask from this person who has this finite field what that number p is. Okay. Now I'm going to claim something stronger. Okay. There's a reason why I call this guy p. Okay. The thing is, this number has to be prime. Okay. It cannot be a composite number. It cannot have any factors. Okay, so that means proof, we will try to prove it, but before that, this number p is called characteristic. Okay, so this p is called characteristic of f. Okay, and any finite field has to have a finite characteristic. Okay, the infinite fields, what about them? Like the rational numbers. They do not have a finite characteristic. They have an infinite characteristic. In fact, for those fields, characteristic is said to be 0. So it is just a crazy definition. That is how it is. So when somebody says field of characteristic 0, they mean an infinite field like the rationals, reals, or the algebraic number fields, or the complexes, the function fields. So many other fields are there. So one of those fields is what they mean by saying the characteristic 0 field. Okay? So those, they do not have a finite characteristic. So, but any finite field has to have a finite characteristic. And moreover, the characteristic of a finite field has to be prime. Okay, so let's try to quickly prove that. It's not a very difficult proof. Okay, characteristic of a finite field is prime. Okay, so this is what I'm going to try to prove. Okay, so how do you prove this? Okay, so standard way to prove many of these results is to assume the opposite and show that there is a contradiction. Okay. So p I know is the smallest number of times I have to add 1 to itself to give me 0 on the field. Suppose it is not prime. Okay? Suppose p is r times s. Okay? Suppose p equals r times s. Then what will happen? You, you can do this identity. 1 plus 1 plus 1 p times. Okay? You can use the distributive property of the field and show it will be the same as 1 plus 1 plus 1 r times multiplied by 1 plus 1 plus 1 s times. Okay. So, this is not too bad to show. Okay. So, uh, right hand side you have 1 plus 1 plus 1 p times and that on the left hand side you have 1 plus 1 plus 1 p times and the right hand side also you have 1 plus 1 plus 1 p times. Okay. So, you use the distributive law. Take the first one multiply on the right. You will have s once. 
The second one here multiply on the right, you will have s more ones. How many such s's will you have? R times. So, R times s is p. So, you will have p times 1 now. P, p ones adding on the right hand side also. Okay. So, now I know this guy is 0. Okay. Right. So, now suppose 1 plus 1 plus 1 R times is 0. If it is 0, then I already have a contradiction. What is the contradiction? R is less than p and 1 plus 1 plus 1 R times is 0. That is not supposed to happen. P was supposed to be the minimum. Now, suppose it is non zero. I am going to claim that 1 plus 1 plus 1 s times has to be 0. Why is that true? If it is non zero, I know this guy has a multiplicative inverse in s. I will multiply by the multiplicative inverse on both sides. What will happen? This guy will become 1 itself. On the left hand side, we will have 0 times that, which becomes 0. Okay? So, you will have 1 plus 1 plus 1 s times is 0. Okay? So, in any field, one property that is true is if a, b is 0, either a has to be 0 or b has to be 0. That is true in any field. Okay, so that's the general fact. So it's easy to show. Okay, so if a b is zero, a is not zero, then you multiply by the inverse of a, you get b is zero. Okay, so if a b is zero, either a is zero or b is zero. Okay, that is true in any field. Okay, so from here you get a contradiction. Okay, the exact concept of contradiction is easy to write down. I'm not going to write it down for you. So you can say from here either one plus one plus one r times has to be zero or 1 plus 1 plus 1 s times has to be 0 and that contradicts the minimality of p. Okay. So, p has to be prime. Okay. So, that implies, so that is the end of it. By the way, what is QED? Some Latin stuff I think so, hence proved. Okay. So, so, at the end of that proof people write QED. Okay. So, that is the end of the proof. Okay. So, so that is nice. So, I mean we already made some pretty big progress here. right? So, we started with some finite field somebody said you had and now we have so much more information about the field you know there is a 0 and a 1 we also know that it has a characteristic p which is a prime okay which is again interesting okay so now we can now find p elements of the field okay what are the p elements I know that f contains contains 0 it has 1 it also has 1 plus 1 which I am going to call as 2 okay so on still it has 2p minus 1. Okay. Oh my goodness. Okay. It may have more stuff, but it has definitely up to p minus 1. So that is p minus 1. It's basically 1 plus 1 plus 1 added p minus 1 times. Up to that I know it's not 0. Yeah. Okay. If I add it p times, I'm going to get 0. Okay, so we can just stop there. We know this much is okay. In fact, the next statement is interesting. It turns out, remember I started with some arbitrary finite field. I didn't know anything about it. Okay? Now, I can say something very, very definite. It turns out, this is true. This guy, okay, this guy, 0, 1, 2, p minus 1, which is a subset of f, is isomorphic to 2 r. Who is that? are very very familiar mod p integer uh, okay so it is exactly z p in this guess okay the zero is the zero of z p one is the one of z p two is the two of z p and all that. okay so you can try proving this it's, it's not very hard because it's a one plus one plus one right how many other times you want so when you multiply it's the same as doing modulo p in in integers okay it's the exact same thing it doesn't change anything okay Think about it. So, if you are adding 1 plus 1 plus 1 some r times inside this and 1 plus 1 plus 1 s times inside that, you multiply the two of them together, it is the same as multiplying the integers r and s modulo p. Okay, how many times you have to add 1 and do that? Because others would be p times and p times when you add something, it goes to 0. Okay. So, this guy is isomorphic to z. Okay, yes. So, just like that, the way I am constructing 0 to p minus 1 will determine everything about the field. Not everything, a significant part of it, yes. Uh, at least about of the Yes, yes, completely. Yes. Okay, so the question is so the finite field this is very limited in some sense. Okay, so it cannot do all kinds of arbitrary stuff. Okay, it has to have a ZP for something. Okay, so that is why when I told you in F9, for instance, 1 plus 1 plus 1 has to be 0. Okay, so there are some some statements about that. We will we'll prove that soon. So, this is the next fact that we are saying. So, there are two facts which are very easy to nail down and then that gives you a fantastic uh, fantastic feel for what finite fields are. Okay, so, so, in any finite field, 
there will be an isomorphic copy of ZP, okay? So Z2, Z3, Z5, Z7, things you know very well, the integers modulo P, okay? It has to happen. So, so, so let me give you an example. If you say, for instance, P is 7, okay? And then you have, you want to multiply 1 plus 1 plus 1 by, let's say, 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, okay? You know these two guys belong to F, okay? I'm going to say this is equivalent to multiplying 3 times 4 mod 7, which is what? 12 mod 7, which is 5, which is 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 in F. Okay, there's also one more. Okay, this is in Z7. Okay. It's quite easy to prove it. You multiply this out, how many ones you will have? 1 plus 1 plus 1, 12 ones you will have, right? 12 ones, but you know 7 of them will add to 0, okay? Because my P was 7. So, you will have, you will be left with 5, which is 1 plus 1 plus 1. So, it's kind of a trivial statement, but, but it's, it's very important, okay? So, the fact that you have also P inside any finite field is important, okay? So, this P is a characteristic, which is an important, uh, important property of the finite field. So, somebody tells you a finite field, you should first figure out what the characteristic is, ask them about the characteristic. Okay. The next statement is even more interesting. Okay, it really fits fits everything very well. S is a finite dimensional vector space. We are going to call as ZP, okay. Not only is does S contain an isomorphic copy of ZP, it is also a finite dimensional vector space over ZP. The fact, the fact that it is finite dimensional is not too critical. The whole field itself is finite, so of course dimension cannot be infinite. The fact that it is a vector space is critical, okay. So here there is an abstract vector space. So this is what I said we will use the abstract definition, okay. So you have an object S which is unknown to you. You know that there is a field inside it. Okay, I want to show that this object, whatever it is, has to be a finite dimensional vector space over this set. Okay, so it's very easy to show. It's not very hard. Okay, so so I mean I, I don't know. Then you, you can you can think about uh, two elements of the field F. Okay, if you add them, you should get another element of the field. That's a property of the field addition. There's no problem. So addition has nothing to check. Only thing that you might have to check is scalar multiplication, and that's also trivial because anyway the scalar is again part of the field. You multiply some scalar with uh, another element of the field, you will get another element of the field, there is no problem. Okay. So, it is kind of a trivial thing to check that this is a vector space. Okay. What is slightly non trivial is, suppose I tell you the dimension is m, okay. not non trivial, non trivial fact. Okay. If I tell you the dimension is m, what is the size of f? It has to be p power m. Okay. Right. So, the proof is, is quite easy. So, I will leave it for. Uh, Let's check the axioms. It's not very hard. Okay, so P is a field. We just check the axioms; it will work out. So, important corollary of this fact is so suppose M is the dimension of F over Z P. Okay, then size of F is P power M. Okay. So we've come a long ways from just a finite field. Somebody told me it's finite field. I asked for a characteristic, you know it's a prime number, P. And then the next thing I ask is as a vector space over Z P, what is your dimension? Suppose the answer is M, then I know that F has P power M elements. Okay. Now remember primes are special numbers, I mean you can't, if you have one prime and you have p power m, you cannot have another prime for which the same number will be p power n or something, it's not possible, it's only one prime number. So now you can see why when I said f9, 1 plus 1 plus 1 has to be 0, why is that true? If I have a finite field with 9 elements, right, 9 is 3 squared, that's the only prime number for which it is a power, right, so the characteristic has to be 3. So, 1 plus 1 plus 1 has to be 0. 
Otherwise, I will not have a field. Okay, the same thing with F4. F4, 4 can be written as a power of prime in a unique way, 2 squared. So, 2 has to be the characteristic of F4. So, 1 plus 1 has to be 0 in F4. Okay. So, these characteristic 2 fields are quite crucial in coding because they are very nice, nicely represented with bits. So, they are used a lot in coding. So, characteristic 2 is quite important. The characteristic 2 is the simplest. Right? When you add 2 things, you do not do anything in this. Very easy. Or 2 is the same as XOR. Okay, but other characteristics are also, I mean, at least in theory, they are nice. So we'll deal with them in another way. Okay. So this this fact is very important. So one thing we have proven now is any finite field has to have what kind of number of elements? Prime power m. Okay. So if I have a number like ten, I cannot have a finite field with ten n. So that's a highly non-trivial fact. Before we started, if I just told you that there's no finite field of size ten elements. You may not have believed me, okay, but that's true. Okay. So you cannot have a finite field with number of elements which is not a power of n, power of a prime. Okay. So it has to be prime or power of a prime. Okay, that has to be true. Okay, so those are facts that you prove. Okay, so you can prove it just based on the same argument. If it is not a prime, then the characteristic will have a problem. So any finite field has to have prime power number of elements. Okay, so this is an important fact. Okay, so that's uh, what's interesting. Okay, so it turns out this is not the end of finite field structure. There's lots of very very interesting structures for finite fields, and so far I've not mentioned anything about polynomials. Okay, so polynomials over finite fields play a very important role in finite field construction, understanding the property, understanding the structures, and all that. We'll come to it slowly. And they're both intertwined very very inseparably. Okay, polynomials over finite fields and the finite field constructions. Okay, so we'll slowly come to it. For now, I think even this is a non-trivial fact, and we have been able to slowly prove it without any, you know, there is no non-elementary step in any of these. Just basic elementary prime numbers, nothing great about it. We were able to come to a statement where the size of the finite field has to be power of a prime. Okay, any questions? No? I'm sorry? Connection between? Yeah, we will come to it. We will come to it. Sir. Okay, so, 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 so now how do we describe all the elements of the finite field? That's the next question. Right? So, so far we have defined only Zp, which is a small part of it, presumably. It cannot be power m, no? There might be other elements. How do you define the other elements? Okay? So, you have to know, so, so, so you can do it in several ways now. So, you know, I know f is a vector space over Zp. So, what can I ask next? I can ask for the, for the basis of this vector space over Zp. Okay? That would give me a complete description of the finite field, right? So that's the next thing you can ask. Basis of S over Z. Okay. So let's say we have alpha one, alpha two. It's very common to use alpha for elements of finite field. Okay. So it's not uh, not my convention. Everybody uses alpha. Okay. So you have m of them. Some m elements of the finite field which form a basis for it over Zp. I don't know what these guys are, but I know that should be a basis I can find out. Okay. Once I have this, what are all the elements of F? Okay, then I know F is A1 alpha 1 plus A2 alpha 2 so on to Am alpha M. And then what are these AIs? Are elements of Z. That's it. Okay, so not only do I have basis elements, I also have one description for every element of the finite field. I have this alpha one, alpha m being some basis elements. Then I can do this. Okay. Okay. So this finite field, uh, this vector space kind of description of the finite field is very very good for one thing. Okay, one of the operations in the field can be very easily done with this vector space description. What is that operation? Look at it. See, remember, I mean ultimately I am interested in doing computation of this finite field. I am not doing this for some abstract pleasure or something like that. Okay, I want some, maybe also that, but you, I want to be able to do computations with this. Okay, I can represent every element of this finite field in a computer program very easily. right? I have a, a vector of length m, each m is an entry from Zp 
I can nicely represent it. How will I add any two of these guys? Adding is very easy, it's very trivial. All I have to remember is modulo p for the coefficient. That's all. Okay. Addition of two elements is very easy in this vector space notation. Okay. What do I do for multiplication? Okay. Right. It's a bit more complicated and it's messy in this notation. Right. What all information do you need? I mean, if you ask this guy who gave you the finite field, I mean, you need to know a lot of things. You need to know what happens when you multiply alpha one with alpha two. Okay. How do you? What element do you get? What happens when you multiply the alpha one with alpha three? You need so many descriptions of multiplications. Okay. Doesn't seem like a very efficient way to do multiplication. Okay, and that's true. Okay, so multiplication is still remains a challenge. Okay, you can do it, but you'll have to ask for so much information. Okay, so you'll have to say, you'll have to say what is alpha one times alpha two. You give me that as an element of this vector, and then you say what is alpha one times alpha three. All this information you have to get, and then you can multiply. Okay, but you need a big uh, lookup table for all these things. Else. Maybe it's not a very, maybe it's not a very easy easy thing to do. Okay. Now it turns out the multiplicative structure of finite fields is also very very easy. Okay, and it has a very nice thing. See, one thing we are not exploiting here is, at least not directly, is the multiplicative group. We haven't tried to understand much about the multiplicative group. Okay, we only have the additive group, which is this nice uh, vector space. But the multiplicative group is not clear. We don't we don't have a handle on. Okay, it turns out that group is really really simple. I'd be very surprised at how easy that multiplicative group is. Okay, so it turn, turns out to be generated by just one element, and it's very very nice. Okay, so we'll see that next. Okay, so next thing we're going to see is how to understand the multiplicative group better. Okay, so 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 before that, before we go and understand the multiplicative group, I'm going to give you a general construction for FP param. Okay, so I'll give you a general construction. Okay, so this construction. So, so what? Remember what we showed till now. If there is a field f with finite number of elements, size of f has to be equal to p power m. Okay, but we don't know if for every p and every m, a field of size p power m exists. We don't know that. Okay, we know that if there is a field, it has to have some prime power as the size, right? We showed you examples for f4 and f9. What about f16? What about f8? What about f121? I don't know. So, so are there fields of that size? Yeah, that's a very valid question. We don't know if there are fields of that size for any prime power. Okay, so this construction will answer that question. It will tell you at least partially if you believe one fact that it is a that is there exists always for a p and m there always exists at least one finite field of size f p power. Okay, so the first thing we will start with is a polynomial which I call pi x. Which is which is irreducible degree m in F P X. Okay. So F P we know what it is. Right? So F P is the same as Z P. Okay. Remember that. And in F P X, I want a degree m polynomial which is irreducible. Okay, so you might wonder, what if there is no degree m polynomial which is irreducible? Okay, so it turns out that cannot be true. Okay, so that is a fact we'll prove later on. But for now, for every degree, okay, in every p, okay, there will be always at least one irreducible polynomial in uh, F P X. Okay, so that's the fact. Okay, so you have to you have to believe that. Okay, so this is a fact. It exists. Okay, such a such a polynomial exists. There's no problem. Okay, but just accept. Okay, so we saw a few examples. For so every degree, you saw that there was at least one reducible polynomial. The example that we saw. Okay, it turns out you can show in general that it's true for any degree. Okay, we'll maybe come back and prove it later. Okay, but for now, we'll we'll accept this as a fact. So once you have this, it turns out. The following construction works. Okay. F P power m. You can make it as a zero plus a one alpha 
7 till km minus 1 alpha power m minus 1. Remember alpha is the indeterminate, okay? The indeterminate that we've been having. Okay. Okay, so these AIs will come from Z T. Okay. Alright. And then the most important thing is tau of alpha equals zero. Okay. So this is the generalization of the simple construction I gave you for F4 and F9. Okay, I gave you two example construction and this is the most general version of it. Okay, for any P and any M, you can do this construction. You look at, you take your indeterminate alpha and look at all polynomials of degree less than or equal to M minus 1. Okay, degree strictly less than M with coefficients from Zp. Okay, this is similar to what I did for F4 and F9. You can go back and check. It's the exact same thing I did. Okay. And then I need a condition on alpha for the multiplication. See, for addition, this is good enough. For multiplication, I need to know how to simplify multiplication. For that, I will use pi of alpha as 0. Remember, pi of alpha is a degree m polynomial. Okay. So, when you do pi of alpha as 0, it gives you an expression for alpha power m in terms of lower powers. And that is good enough. Once I have alpha power m in terms of lower powers, that's good enough. I can also find alpha power m plus 1, m plus 2, so on. Again, repeatedly I can do. Okay, so this basically gives you alpha power m in terms of 1 alpha alpha power m minus 1. Okay, and that's good enough. So when you multiply two polynomials, you simply use this rule repeatedly and simplify it and we will get back to another expression. Okay. And since pi of alpha is irreducible, it turns out this is a field. Okay. The irreducibility is crucial. If it is not irreducible, it will not work. Okay. Since pi of alpha is irreducible, this guy is a field. Okay. So, we can prove that. It is not very hard. We will prove it soon enough. Okay. So, how do you prove it? Okay. The only non-trivial thing is existence of multiplicative inverse. Okay. Do you agree or not? Okay. Addition and multiplication are being done modulo pi of alpha, right? Another way to think of multiplication, if you are confused about this pi of alpha rule, you take two of these polynomials, you multiply them, just like polynomial multiplication. You will get a bigger polynomial. You divide by pi of alpha. You will get a reminder, right? The reminder is the answer of the multiplication. It is the exact same thing as using this alpha power m rule over and over again. Okay. Right? So, if you have A of alpha and B of alpha and of P power M, A of alpha times B of alpha is the same, same as what? Times N of P power M is the same as A of alpha, B of alpha mod pi of alpha. Okay, so how do I do mod? I multiply and then I do that long division with pi of alpha, whatever reminder I get, I pick it up. Okay, so it is the same as that. Okay? So that is your multiplication. Okay? So how do I show that everything has to have a multiplicative inverse? Every element has to have a multiplicative inverse. Okay? You remember for Zp we showed that, no? You remember the proof we did for Zp. What is the proof I did for Zp? Remember. I wrote down all the elements and then I multiplied i with each of the elements. And I argue P, P times I and P times J mod P can never be the same. Why is that true? If it is same, then P times I minus J. No, not P times, I am sorry. What did I say? Did I get that right? A times I and A times J. Sorry, A times I minus J has cannot be equal to 0 mod P because P has to divide A times I minus J and that is not going to happen. The exact same proof will work here. Except that these are polynomials, but I know pi of alpha is irreducible. Okay? If I have an A of alpha, I multiply by all these elements. Okay? But A of alpha times B, B of alpha cannot be equal to A of alpha times C of alpha. Okay? If it is equal, then what will happen? Pi of alpha has to divide A of alpha times B of alpha minus C of alpha and that is not going to happen because, because pi of alpha is irreducible. Okay? So, the exact same proof as, okay, same proof as As for Zp will work here. 
Okay, so you will never have a repetition when you take your particular polynomial and multiply by all the other elements of FP para, which means in particular there should be one polynomial which will multiply and give me one. Okay. So that's the simple proof that you have for this result. The same proof as we did for the P, except that now we have a polynomial. Okay. Just repeat the same thing, and I know power alpha is irreducible, so it cannot be product of two factors on that side. It's as easy as that. Okay, so there's nothing uh, major about it. And at this point, we'll stop for this class, and uh, tomorrow we'll pick up from here. Okay, so the only thing we haven't seen is the multiplicative structure. Okay, so we've seen the additive structure, and we've understood it well enough. The multiplicative structure. The only thing that seems to be in this construction is product of two polynomials is then modulo an irreducible polynomial. Okay, but like I said, there is much more stronger multiplicative structure, which we will see in general first, and then we'll specialize to this construction. Okay, it turns out there is more to this construction than meets the eye. For instance, there is no other finite field other than this. You can essentially show that. Okay, any other finite field of size p par m will be isomorphic to this. Okay, so it's not very surprising. If you think about finite dimensional vector spaces, any two are the same. Right? So likewise, even in the multiplicative structure, you cannot have anything. Okay, so it's the same. Any two finite fields will be isomorphic. So, so this one construction is good enough. You don't have to worry about anything else. Okay, so we'll see those facts in the next class.